Sellers are scared. Buyers are scared. But should we really be this nervous? Coming up, the first of a two-part interview with my friend Dave Hill from Bell Mortgage. Today, we'll dive deep into where the economy is now, where it's possibly going, why there's reason to be optimistic, and maybe even a little bit nervous. And the ultimate answer to this question, should you buy a home today? That's coming up. Hi, I'm Wade Hansen. I've been selling luxury real estate in Minnesota and Wisconsin for over 23 years. My entire career has been spent protecting my clients from misinformation and unethical practices by those not looking out for their best interests. This podcast will give you the raw truth about everything real estate so you can make solid, informed decisions about the biggest investment of your lifetime. This is the Raw Real Estate Podcast. I want to talk a little bit about your predictions for next year. Fed's going to meet next week. Uh, they say they're going to raise rates, the, the prime, anywhere from, what, half to three quarters of a point. Uh, we've seen rates. This is the, the, the largest 12-month, how do I say this, the largest 12-month rate increase we've seen in 50 years. Is that mm-hmm. correct? That, that is. They've gone from uh, somewhere in the threes to right around seven. Uh, so they've essentially doubled. Um, what, what are you... What are you predicting? What are you forecasting for next year? I know as a company here at, at Results, I believe they're predicting about a 20% downturn in just transaction count in general. It's pretty substantial. Now we're coming mm-hmm. off of two of the best years we've ever seen in the history, right. and not, not just my 20-some years, not just yeah. your 30-some years, in the history of real estate. We've never seen two years like this. What are you thinking for next year and, and, and beyond? Predictions are tricky, but I'm not afraid to make one because I do. <laughs> I have put a lot of thought into this. I think you have this. to. Yeah, you have to. You know, it goes back to the metaphor I keep in my pocket based on an interview Wayne Gretzky had, the great hockey player. He was interviewed one time, and the interviewer asked, you know, why do you seem to be so much better than everybody else on the ice? He goes, and this is a metaphor that I've used forever now. He goes, um, you know, hockey players were trained to go where the puck is, to skate to the puck. I skate to where the puck's going to be. Yep. You know, and if you think about the financial markets, what a great metaphor for what we need to do. How do you create, you know, a mega success while others are struggling or asking what happened? You have to look at what possibly could happen in the future. And there's patterns, you know, when you can start to recognize patterns in history, you can somewhat predict the future to, to you know, there's outlier events, of course. Sure. You know, look at this FTX that just collapsed. COVID. Right? You know, COVID. Yeah. And if we go back to the, to the great foreclosure crisis, countrywide, the number one lender in the country in 2005 is going to be filing for bankruptcy in 2008 mm-hmm. until Bank of America stepped in and bailed him out, which almost destroyed Bank of America. But then four months later, Lehman Brothers on Wall Street fails, collapses because of their heavyweighted uh, subprime mortgages when those got marked to market and realized they had assets way underneath you know, the, the portfolio of loans they were keeping. So there is predictors. And so what I'm thinking 2023, I think we're in for a couple of quiet months. I really do. You know, consumers are, are, are trying to figure out their savings and, you know, what they want to do. And, and is it a good time to leverage this opportunity where now maybe there is more time to negotiate on a home? Mm-hmm. So I think when that kind of settles down and we get some stability with what the Fed is trying to do, mm-hmm. If we just see a little bit of inflation reduction, a little bit of tamed inflation, I anticipate, I'm going to predict that interest rates, 30-year fixed rates, will stabilize around 5.5% and will be in a market that is not a record year, but it's going to be you know, over 5 million uh, home sales national. I want to interject for a second. You said uh, you, you predict that interest rates will, will table and, and settle in somewhere around 5.5%. Mm-hmm. When do you think that will happen in your professional I, I opinion? I think by spring, okay. March, April. Okay. And, and as uh, we sit today, uh, hopefully just you'll have me back and we can. <laughs> no, and I, I love predictions. I'm going to make some too. And um, just and just for context, as we sit here today, it's what, six and three quarters? Is that accurate? Yeah, so you think we got a little bit of improvement. Okay. So, uh, about a point recently, down, you think yeah, sometime in the next say six and a half 90 days to 120 days? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm and sorry. I want to build a case for that, but sure. then I want you and I to look at each extreme on the other side of that, yep. right? The extreme where all of a sudden something happens and it's a record year. And there is a case for that. Mm-hmm. And then the other extreme is 
uh, some events happen, inflation doesn't get tamed, and we're in for a long, long mm-hmm. winter, you mm-hmm. know, maybe f- back to the 2009 levels of mm-hmm. 4 million home sales. And that's where the uncertainty comes in. I, I think so you're, much you're, uncertainty. You're so right. We could go either direction on this on this, um, on this this road we're on right now, right? So, And uh, one could lead us into a, a, a solid housing market, and one could lead us yeah. into a not so good, not so yeah. pretty picture. So let me talk about the case for 5.5% interest rates. Okay. And remember, mortgage interest rates trade daily, so they're not going to just stay at 55 right. but right. a range between five and a quarter and five right. and three quarters, let's say. And I think home prices will stabilize about 15% off their highs. But, you know, that's a harder prediction because you're talking generically. Some areas may, yes. you know, yeah. stabilize at, um, you know, levels that are close to their highs, right? right? Because they're hot markets. Yeah. In some, like, you know, some areas of St. Paul, for example, where homes were selling in multiple offers may, you know, have a 30 percent 40 percent decline from the crazy highs of you know multiple offers 40,000 over list price and so there's these outliers but in general I think if you were going to take an average you probably uh, you know 15 to 20 percent maybe off of the very highs Mm -hmm. so you and I talked about you know a 1.1 million dollar home maybe today would be Mm 900,000 so that's a 20 percent discount off that crazy high multiple mm-hmm. offers at mm-hmm. 1.1 million or, or and just whatever. for context on that I'm going to interject again as we sit here today we're right now about down about 10 percent from I would say April I believe April was about the high uh, maybe May okay. was about the high generally speaking again generalizing we're down uh, market-wide in my market about 10 percent home values okay. are. some as much as 20 some as little as five yeah but we, we've we reached a peak and uh, we're now looking at about a 10% reduction in home values right now. So I think you're spot on with your, your comments of being somewhere in that 15 to 20% range by the time we land in first quarter of next year. So right. I'll let you keep going on Okay, so let me build the case for my prediction for 2023 and 2024. You've got the Fed, although behind the curve, Jerome Powell, he's a moderate and he's smart. And my son, Mike, loves him. My partner, Brian, uh, you know, doesn't, He's kind of like me, <laughs> thinks they were behind the curve. Yeah. So we'll see. But let's say that this um, December uh, Fed rate increases a half a percent, and then let's look at CPI and PPI numbers. They're at 7.8 now, I think it was. And, you know, the Biden administration was celebrating that because the month before it was 8%, right? right? So inflation was still high. They're celebrating it because it came down you know a fraction yeah but people that are filling up their gas tank or going to the grocery store feel inflation right so we have to look beyond you know how do you tell if a politician is lying <laughs> they're talking right <laughs> so uh, we have to look at what what is happening in the marketplace right. and right. anticipate what the consumer is thinking so let's say that we start to see inflation come down a little bit right without Fed intervention in the interest rates are reversing course and unemployment staying strong, I think that my prediction is a good one. I think that is a good one based on historical patterns. Because if you look at once we recovered from the subprime uh, mortgage crisis into almost up to the pandemic, rates in that 5% range, except for a few you know, economic slowdowns, was a healthy market. I think, um, A buyer's market is considered where there's six months or more inventory available, and a seller's market is three months inventory or less. Well, we're still running two months inventory right now based on the market. Mm -hmm. During the boom, it was zero. You know, so it was crazy times, Wade, that I don't think we'll ever see again. We might see something approach a seller's market, but nothing like that. That was that was absolutely bizarre. And so coming out of that, you know, people that have only been in our industry 10 years or less never saw an interest rate 5% or above. You know, we've been on the Fed intervention for since 2008. Here's an interesting t- statistic I heard uh, about a week ago. I believe it's 85% of agents in this industry right now have never seen interest rates over 5% and have never seen days on market more than 30 days. 85 percent. So that means yeah. only 15 percent of agents have seen either a balanced market uh, or a buyer's market. Yeah, they've, they've all seen this frenzy that we've gone through. Yeah. So that's an interesting fact. And I want to just interject again on on your predictions. And I, I hate to keep doing this, but 
and this is kind of the uh, the devil's advocate, right? So this is just, I think, economics 101. So if Fed, they're raising um, interest rates to try to stop spending, right? right. To try to yep. reduce inflation, right? That's so right. if I stop spending, I stop buying goods, whatever that might be, certain companies and certain industries are going to slow down. They're going to have to cut jobs. Therefore, unemployment should go up. Now what? <laughs> right? Now you're talking about that double-edged sword that you talked about, right? That's right. Raising rates may end up raising unemployment and may put us into a tailspin. And if people aren't employed uh, or if they've got to take pay cuts, which I think is going to have to happen over the next 12 months, they can't afford to buy things like homes, right? So, Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we'll make the case for, you know, a a long winter, okay? But I think for – because our economy is so big and so resilient – and it has so many, you know, tools with Fed policy to be able to intervene. I do feel like businesses will, can, you know, certain sectors will continue to grow and expand while others may contract a little bit. I heard Amazon laid off 10,000 workers. I don't know. I think that was just a sound bite, so I hope I've got that right. But, yeah. you know, you see unemployment growing, the 260,000 jobs added in November. Well, 45,000 were government workers in Washington, D.C. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you got to look at underlying the numbers. Right. But just based on what I'm sensing in mm-hmm. the marketplace right now in the economy and the fact that, you know, 50%, over 50% of homeowners have 30% or more of the value of their home in equity. That wasn't the case in 2008, 2009. You've got uh, consumer confidence kind of low right now, but there's a, there's a psychology of crowds and the news is all being negative. So <clears throat> some of that wouldn't take much for people if they feel there's an advantage to be in the real estate market and to trade up or buy a new home. It wouldn't take much. You know, It would just take um, those of us that are in the business to lay out the advantages, right? Mm-hmm. The other reason I, and so my prediction is kind of based on what I hope will happen, you sure. know, because it's a healthy market. Because people in our industry wait at rates at five and a half percent actually have to work to get paid. You know, you talk about uh, some of the agents who've never been on a price reduction appointment, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we tried this price, here's the feedback, we need mm-hmm. to make some adjustments. Mm-hmm. So, in, in lenders, explaining the advantages of how you can use real estate to build long-term financial security and wealth for your family. And there may be some advantages, you know, that um, people aren't recognizing now but will recognize when rates stabilize at five and a half. So, and the reason I I do think that's a possibility because now everybody knows rates were approaching seven and when your Uber driver tells you they're going to 11, you know, the psychology is rates are way up, right? right? And they're going to be way up. So five and a half is going to look like a deal. Yep. And then the affordability is is good at five and a half. And then if we get to a um, normal yield curve, we'd have adjustable rate mortgages, you know, seven one, ten one arms, and the threes. So you you're going to have a lot of opportunities to buy a home, maybe at off its highs. So yep. you're feeling like you're getting a better a better deal. We've had two homes recently that have sold for a contract sale price where the appraisal came in $50,000 higher. Now, I know the appraisers are using comps from sure. the crazy times, yeah. but it's it's a nice feeling for those folks who bought today mm-hmm. to say, wow, all I need is the market to just mm-hmm. stabilize, and I've just picked up 50000 or more in equity. Mm-hmm. So that that's why I think it could happen. And I, I, I predict it based on tangible information, right, that the Fed might be successful in their, um, you know, war on inflation, Mm -hmm. in that it seems like we're in an economy where you keep hearing there's 4 million jobs and, you know, there's jobs openings. You got to dig down to see that a lot of them are, you know, service and in second jobs and, you know, not your high income jobs, but there are a lot of jobs available. And then new industries are developing all the time through artificial intelligence and you know robotics and things so new new industries will will expand so if we think about that that would be a great scenario for those of us in the business but more importantly for the consumers in general housing would be stabilized we'd be back to normal appreciation three to five percent a year we'd have uh, good interest rates for the consumer home equity lines of credit would be available at, at better interest rates 
and uh, you know that spurs the economy when people do home improvements on their home. So that's my prediction. Now let's take you and I. <laughs> you can play a little devil's advocate yeah. with me on this one. Let's start with a real optimistic. Let's say that um, 2023 into 2024, we're back into a neutral market, but it's kind of boom times. Homes are selling fast. We're heading towards nationally 6 million units again. Everybody's busy, productive. Uh, the market is stabilized. It's not crazy appreciation. People aren't dealing with multiple offers on every transaction. So what would have to happen for that? You know, we'd have to have the interest rates come back to probably historical lows, right, mm -hmm. in the fours. Mm -hmm. We'd have to have unemployment be a real number at 3 or 3.7%. Because I don't, I don't believe that number. Do you know how unemployment is calculated by the feds? Explain it for the for the So viewer, a yes. lot of people think it's just they look at who who's collecting unemployment right. and calculate you know how many workers there are and then but it isn't that that has nothing to do with the unemployment rate. It's actually screwy how they do it. It's like the census. You know they they do a census survey of sixty thousand households mm -hmm. and they actually ask you know. Are you in the job market, and are you employed? And then they calculate it based on that. Right. So if they, and 60,000 sounds like a small sample when you're talking 330 million people, but it's actually a pretty big sample. A lot of these statistics are done on 1,000, you know, uh, 1,000 interviews. So I don't have any argument with the 60,000 number, but how do you ask the question? How do you frame it? It can be easily manipulated, right? So if somebody doesn't want to, come clean or they say, uh, no, I'm working, but their job is like a, a part-time job that they want to get out of. You know, it's not really their long-term right. uh, career path. So I think unemployment right now is at least 8% or mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there are job openings, there's a lot of immigration happening, I do think that we have an opportunity to stay at full employment, but they're not calculating it properly right now. Sure. So when you think about what um, that means is if unemployment really is at 8%, going higher because of the Fed, what they're doing, and the Fed doesn't get a handle on inflation, and that gets out of hand, let's say it comes out or stays at 8 9%, that is you know, destroying the middle class in the, you know, the poor. Mm -hmm. In our, our country, I think, weight is big enough to handle about 20% of the population on hard times at any one time, right? There's safety nets through the government. There's churches and nonprofits. There's relatives that help out. But when you start getting the 30 or 40% of the population with no savings and on hard times and can't find a job, that's the recipe for a calamity and a collapse of the housing market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both of those are possibilities. You know, the, the one I don't even like to think about. Mm -hmm. where, and then, it, then throw in some uh, outlier event, you know, a run on the banks or a bank right. collapse or right. something like right. that, you know, that happens. Uh, a conflict escalating yeah. in, in Ukraine mm -hmm. that uh, pulls us even deeper in. Mm -hmm. You know, then we're in for a tough, tough time. If you're in a position where you don't have a lot of savings and you don't have a lot of, you know, prospects for employment, yeah, yeah. so let's just hope that doesn't happen. But it's a real possibility for sure. Yeah. So you went really deep into, you know, the economy and how, you know, one factor could affect another, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to just go at a really high level and tell you that. The majority of the home buyers out there right now, and you're probably seeing this too, is they're the millennials, right? right. That's the younger yeah. generation. That's that's who's buying homes right now. They're buying the entry level homes, which those people will then sell to move up and so on and so forth. So they're kind of driving the market right now. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. That consumer has never seen the interest rates that we're at now. And even if they dip to five and a half, they're still going to be really, really high for them. They watched their parents get burnt in the last housing recession, so they're they're getting whispers in their ear from their from their parents about what's going to happen in the housing market. And, and us as parents, right, we're always a little bit more pessimistic about things and always uh, expect the worst for, and, and want to yeah. make sure that we protect our kids. Negative bias. Um, for yep, sure. yep. So they're hearing some of that. Um, they are going to be some of the first to get cut uh, when uh, when un when. Um, when we can't get inflation under control and, and we need to get and jobs start to get cut, I think they're going to be some of those that are going to get cut first. 
Um, and they're they're affected uh, the hardest by gas prices at five dollars a gallon, right? Yeah, they're affected absolutely. by eggs at four dollars a dozen instead of a dollar fifty. They're they're affected yeah, harder absolutely. by these little things than maybe our generation uh, and, and above, you know, the boomers and that type of thing. So. I think that that consumer that's been driving the market, and they really have the last two years, I think what happened the last two years, Dave, is um, we took probably five to seven years of home buying and crunched it into a two-year cycle because, again, those uh, those millennials um, or even move-up buyers said, man, we're looking to do something probably in the next mm-hmm. five years. I don't know that I'm going to see a better time than now, so I'm going to do it now. So we've basically taken you know, the next two or three years worth of buyers and we had them, they purchased the last two That's years. Right. Does yeah, that make sense? It sure does. So I think, I think we're in for potentially a shit storm. Yeah. The next, the next 12 months for sure. Magically things typically get better in an election year but for what doesn't matter who's running. It doesn't matter who's in the white house. It's just, you've seen enough election cycles to know that things tend to get a little bit That's better right. during election year. So we might be saved by the 2024 election mm-hmm. year. Um, and not going deeper into a, a dark housing recession, but I think next year is going to be a really, really a struggle uh, in the housing sector. And look, people still need to buy, right? They get jobs elsewhere. They get there's job loss. They downsize. There's divorces. There's deaths. There's marriages. That's families right. grow. Families downsize. All of those things happen. So we're still going to have buyers buying and, and sellers selling, right? But we're just not going to have the um, the FOMO that we had the last two years, the fear yeah. of missing out. Yeah. And that's all that happened the last two years. Right. So um, that's my um, prediction just based on just the basics of the economy and not getting deeper into it. Yeah. Now, your um, data and your talking points are good ones because I think the the wealthy always get wealthier in a recession, yeah, right? No and they watch those There's things, no right? Yeah. And those are going to be the, the boomers and those are going to be, you know, our generation and, and older mm-hmm. that I think will see opportunity and, and they'll pounce on it and they're going to be buying homes at a discount and, um, and I think discounts are a relative term because I think we created kind of a false ceiling the last year. Yeah. It was just a bidding war. It wasn't yeah. even – homes weren't really worth that. It's just buyers That's were right. paying prices that they said, hey, my monthly payment makes sense, so I'm going to pay this price, mm-hmm. right? So You hit it on the head with the FOMO, too. It's yep, a yep. human um, condition, you know, fear of missing out. Yeah. So, yeah, you make a great case for – the dark side and you know another uh, talking point on that is people that are have refinanced or bought you know with a 2.75 three and a quarter interest rate even if they could trade up you know to take a six and a half percent mortgage or if rates go to eight or nine uh, there's just a case to stay right where they're at you know and prove well, the home that they're in anybody so that's the bought in the last 10 years right i yeah. mean they're going to have an interest rate lower than where it's at today yeah. uh, e- even the last 10 years even if it gets to five and a half that's right they're likely going to have an interest rate lower yeah. than five and a half so why would i make that move if it just doesn't financially make yeah. sense for my family so yeah there is a, a case for that when i think about it you know i don't sleep good that the night <laughs> but there's such a case against it too though, I agree. because mm-hmm. well for example let's look at renters have you seen what you can rent for two thousand a month right. now it's not much and in dakota county for example there's a hundred and three thousand families in rentals uh, 28,000 qualified to buy a home, but there hasn't been inventory, you know, so, um, but let's say that some BlackRock and Open Door, and let's say some of these institutional Wall Street firms that came in and started gobbling up single family homes, maybe their investors say it's time to take profits off the table, get those homes on the market. If we get some inventory mm-hmm. on the market, I think we, have, you know, my case for five and a half percent rates and Stability in the housing market is a good one. I just feel like uh, the demand on housing is there. It may be hidden, maybe in parents' basements or in (laughs) rental units. But as soon as there's a sign that there's a home uh, market that is affordable, and I think that we're going to see a a real good demand. But we're still sitting, even with this idea, you know, you talk about FOMO. Well, there's FOMO for sellers, too. Mm -hmm. If you had a house that had all kinds of, you didn't have to stage your home. You didn't have to do much. Let's say you you are looking at, uh, you know, (laughs) a repair list on your own home. You had an opportunity to put it on the market and let somebody else take over those issues. And so you would think that there would have been more inventory put on the market at the at the start maybe of the year or going into what looked like an inflationary cycle where people say I don't want to miss out and that didn't happen and that that's a, a concern of mine but 
we'll see. You know, I think if we get those rates stabilized, if we get inflation stabilized, and we get good real estate agents and good mortgage bankers leveraging the opportunities for clients and explaining what they are, I think we could be in great shape for 2023 and 2024. But, you know, as a predictor, I would say that's a 40%, you know, <laughs> and then on each side is 30%, 30% yeah. the dark yeah. winter and 30% maybe a, a boom. You know, when you think about when you think about some of the economic indicators, though, they can be scary. There was a couple of things I just read on a, uh, this economist I subscribed to. So yesterday, this is a case against the economy expanding, but maybe inflation coming down. So it's it's so interesting now that everything you read, you have to you have to take each side of it. You know what? How does this affect? Because traditionally, these things would look negative, right? But now, because we're dealing with trying to bring inflation down, maybe not so much. So IPOs in 2021, there were record breaking 1,033 IPOs. Um, year to date, there have been 173 IPOs year to date, uh, effective today. So that means mm -hmm. companies are not going public, they're not expanding to anywhere near the rate. So mm -hmm. okay, that's one. Mm -hmm. And then do you remember uh, during the height of uh, COVID where people could sell their used car? I, I kept oh, getting calls from yes, Mercedes Benz yes, wanting yes. To, you know, me to bring out mm -hmm. my car. They wanted to mm -hmm. sell it, right? It was ringing off the hook. So car costs, this just came out today. Use, used car prices declined 0.3% in November. Month over month, they're down 14.2%. Year over year, uh, back prices that prevailed over a year ago. Compact cars enjoyed the smallest decline, followed by vans and sports cars. Midsize and SUVs fell 16%. So normally you would say, okay, the economy is, that's not good. Mm -hmm. But because we're in this inflation flight fight, maybe it is good. Because as soon as inflation gets tamed, depending on how deep that pushes us into a recession, right. the Fed will reverse course. Yeah. And then trying to, you know, when they raise rates, they're trying to contract the economy. When they lower rates, they're trying Correct. to expand Correct. the economy. I just think we're at a place right now where home affordability is, it's just really, really tough. You know, look at my daughter who's going to graduate college next year. And the positions she's looking at, and she may come to work for me, we'll see what that is. And even at, even at the salary I'm willing to pay her, she can't afford to buy a house. Yeah, yeah, and that's... with houses prices, house, housing prices here and interest rates here right now, one of them's got to give. Yeah. Right now the Fed has said, we're not giving here, so guess what's going to give? Housing yeah. prices, just to make homes affordable. Now if this gives, we might be okay. We might not see that $20,000 dip. Yeah. Um, but if this doesn't give, which they've right now have kind of dug their heels in and said, we're not giving on this. Housing prices have to come down, or the average consumer, back to those millennials, they just cannot afford to purchase a home. Yeah, uh, I think just, it's a national crisis. It is. And I think it's going to um, not be an easy fix. And I'm not a fan at all of government intervention, but if there ever was, if they're ever going to talk about these $1.7 trillion bills, where did trillion come from? I mean, the, <laughs> How know, do we get like, there? Whoa, right. They, right. they're just not even rational to think that they can put $1.7 trillion in the market and not cause inflation. But um, let's say there was some type of, um, you know, and you bring realtors and mortgage bankers and industry professionals together, and you talk about how to subsidize some low, in, you know, a couple million low income housing units. And I don't mean low income like, you know, they have to be uh, in a census track of low income earners. I just mean affordable housing. Right. So they're subsidizing the wrong things when they subsidize interest rates. And uh, what they did, you know, through bringing rates to zero to spur the economy, that created the housing boom, it was a perfect storm of low inventory, high demand and low interest rates to push prices up. Mm -hmm. So the government and the Fed created some of the, uh, the affordability crisis that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I started in the business, you could get a nice home, Cottage Grove or Woodbury for 85, 90,000. Then it went to 210 and I thought, oh man, this is gonna be a big deal. But these were 210 homes that would sell for 450, 500 mm -hmm. now. Well, that's a starter home, so you can't, think that a, a couple, you know, they say that the affordability for a starter home, you have to make 137000 a year. The median income for families is 76000 combined income. Mm -hmm. 
So just in that stat alone, you can see right. that there's a disconnect between affordability right. and right. what people make. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's on us, too. We have to counsel our clients what it takes to own a home, too. You know, it's not just you're in the luxury market, so obviously you've got uh, sophisticated clientele. But when I work with the first-time home buyer, we have to educate them on mm -hmm. what it takes to own a home. And when you do that budgeting with somebody, you realize, you know, it's four or $5,000 a month in hard expenses to right. own a home. Right. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. So I appreciate you coming. appreciate your time. I just want to ask a couple last-minute questions. Number one, based on all this data, all this information, if you were in the market today, would you buy a house today? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I would, too. Yeah. I would, too. I think, I think there's tremendous opportunity out yeah. there right now. And I think what... You know, one thing I learned the last two years is the average uh, American consumer is just monthly payment driven. And they were willing to pay 700000 for a $500,000 house just to get that monthly payment where they want it. I guess I'm not an average consumer. I would rather pay 400000 for that $500,000 house and not necessarily worry about that monthly payment right now. So I think that there's great opportunity for um, consumers to pick up homes at a discounted price right now. There's fear in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Sellers are scared. And when sellers are scared, if a buyer can be calm and collected and cool, they can take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, you think about um, the opportunities right now, Wade, for people who are buying a home. Just six months ago to the, you know, two years prior, you couldn't offer less than list price, unless it was just an outlier, right. grossly overpriced home. Yeah. You couldn't ask for concessions. A lot of people bought with appraisal guarantees. I'll pay for this amount for your home, and if appraises for less, I'll come to closing with the cash to fill the gap. So now you think about the difference. Sellers are already being counseled by their realtors that the market has changed, that we can't use comparables for six months ago. We've got to be realistic if we, you know, we have to use competition now as comparables. And uh, you make an offer with 3% uh, you know, concessions to offset your closing costs. You're, you're getting in a home for 40% less than you were six months ago out right. of pocket. Now, the argument against not buying now is home values are going to slide further. So if I'm a consumer, I'm in the market at all the time waiting, but if the right home comes on, I'm ready to go. I'm right. pre-approved for my loan. I've got my realtor keeping me abreast of every new listing that comes on the market, and uh, I'm ready to go. But if, if uh, there is a further slide, real estate always fixes itself over time, over right. a decade. I mean, they even even if you own homes through the foreclosure crisis, and I, I have, I have you know, homes that I've owned through then, and I have uh, one friend of mine, a realtor friend, he owned three duplexes in South St. Paul, and at one time, through the foreclosure crisis, he was about a, uh, you know, they were about 50% of what he owed, the value, mm -hmm. what he mm -hmm. could sell them for. Well, he held on to them, the renters, you know, he had some gaps with the renters made their payments. Right now, he has uh, like 400000 in equity right. in those properties because he's holding them over the long term. So if you're in real estate and you can afford the payment and you, you can't live somewhere for free, you know, so you've got to compare it to what you would have for your, your lifestyle. But I, I don't know. I think we're in a noble profession. I think we're helping people understand the biggest investment of their lifetime, where their home is, the the advocacy and the advice that we can give can you know save a marriage it can mm -hmm. create happiness that, you know if they make the right decision mm -hmm. or the wrong decision can cause a calamity so i answered fast that i'd be in the market but i would be in it as an educated consumer understanding values understanding what uh, type of loan i need for financing and understanding my complete financial picture and be ready to go yeah. it would be an area that i want to live in it would be a home style that i want to own so i would have that mapped out in my mind you know some goals of what i'm looking for and when that property comes on the market to be able to get it a little bit under market value from the highs would be to me a no-brainer yeah yeah good answer great information i really appreciate you being here uh, great insight. Uh, I hope next year's better than I anticipate. I hope it's uh, a good year for both of us. Uh, I know it will be. We're professionals. I think it's going to be a professional market. And I look forward to working with you in 2023. Yeah, thanks, Wade. I've always appreciated working with you because of what I said before. You know, you anticipate problems before they happen. 
you're a tremendous advocate for your clients and you really have a heart for, for their interests above anything else. So it's, it's always a pleasure to work with realtors like you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks for being here. Elite. Thank you. Wade. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Raw Real Estate Podcast. If you have any feedback for this episode or want to suggest a future topic or even possible guests, head to wadehanson.com. There you can get links to my Facebook and LinkedIn pages. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel to see the video version of this podcast too. Again, thank you for listening to the Raw Real Estate Podcast. We'll talk soon.